Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'd like to welcome everybody. We have a, the privilege of having Hans Boom with us today to, to talk about some memory model work for C++ that's going on. Uh, now, as a, it's hard to summarize in a few sentences the work that Hans has done in our industry. So most of you probably know of him or have worked with him before. He's probably most widely known for doing a garbage collector for C++ implementations, as I believe the most widely used one in the world. Um, and also, as well, he's been involved in the Java memory model work and now is currently coordinating the work for a C++ threading and memory model concurrency work. And so um, with that, this is something that, uh, that I know that Hans has been working on with to, to great effort and moving forward the past year or two. And so I'd like to welcome him here to tell us more about it. Thanks, Phil. I should say that a lot of what I'm talking about here is not, uh, is not solely my own work, or in some cases not at all my own work. So I'll sort of b begin with a blanket disclaimer here, uh, rather than inserting related work slides in various places, which I don't really have time for. Uh, I should also say that this talk, to some extent, is a repeat of one that I gave at PLDI in 2005, though it's been updated significantly. So, so, for, for, so for some of you, this material might seem a little bit familiar. Uh, basically, what I'll talk about is, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll spend about uh, maybe half the talk talking about what the problems are with threads in C and C++ at the moment, uh, why they don't quite work correctly, uh, and wh why something needs to be fixed. And then I'll basically be spending the second half of the talk discussing what we're in fact trying to do about it, the approach we're trying to take, why, this, why we're still at it, why this is not completely trivial, uh, and uh, try to warn you of some of the likely consequences on implementations as a result of this if and when this gets adopted. Okay, so here's a sort of the, the motherhood and apple pie slide, which I suspect I don't really need here. Uh, so multi-threaded programming is important. Uh, and I guess in this environment here, a lot of, there have been a lot of multi-threaded programs around for a long time. Uh, and we all know that uh, they're becoming significantly more important because uh, performance improvements in the future are expected to come from multi-core processes. So we actually need, to need some, some tools for parallelizing code in order to take advantage of those. And threads or some form of shared memory concurrency sort of seems to be the obvious solution because it's what people are used to already. It's what's already being used, uh, though mostly for other reasons. The APIs already exist and tend to be fairly widely used. Uh, and uh, as you'll see from some of the examples here, I'll also argue that there are probably some cases at least in which it's not clear that, you can, that other techniques for parallelizing code are likely to work. Uh, perhaps one can argue because existing hardware is really designed to, uh, with this sort of approach in mind. Okay, common approaches to uh, providing for threads in programming languages are b they're basically two. Uh, the first class uh, is one that I actually won't talk about, I will only mention in passing here in several places, uh, is the one that was originally followed in languages like Java, uh, I guess before that uh, to some extent, and also in, other, in some older languages like Ada, to basically incorporate the uh, the threading mechanisms into the language itself and include those in the language uh, in the language specification. Even in that case, it turns out to be fairly hard to get the semantics right. Uh, Java originally ended up with uh, uh, with a specification which seemed to pe which uh, people sort of accepted for many years before mostly Bill Pugh pointed out that it in fact had serious problems. And in fact, no compilers were implementing it correctly, and you didn't want them to anyway. Uh, so uh, that resulted in an effort that concluded a year or two ago to uh, revise the, the uh, Java memory model, to revise the, the, basically the semantics of threads in Java. Uh, 
but for that sort of language, I think we basically know what the solutions are. At least we know a way to get to a solution, though people are still arguing about whether that's the optimal way to get there or not. Um, the other approach that I'm mostly going to be talking about here is the second one here, uh, which is the the idea that we basically take a single-threaded language in usually C or C++ um, and provide threads by adding a library to it. Uh, this has been, this is arguably the most common existing approach uh, that's mo widely used. Um, it's commonly done with, as I said, either C or C++, combining it with a threads library. Probably the most common one is the, the Win32 threads API. Uh, the, the other one, which I will actually talk about more in this talk, is uh, the pthreads API, for reasons that I'll go into in the, in the next slide here. Um, the idea here is basically that we take a compiler which is uh, and a language spec which are essentially oblivious to threads, which don't know, which assume that the world is single-threaded, and then combine those with a library that provides all the threading facilities we need. Uh, and the point I'll be making in this talk is that this actually, to some extent, is, is closer to correct than one might expect. It's sort of fairly, uh, it's actually surprisingly close to correct, but it's not quite good enough. It's not entirely correct. Uh, as I said, in this talk, I'll use mostly pthreads to fill in any, any specific details, even though, as I said, Win32 threads are probably more widely used. Uh, the reason for that is basically that, uh, that I could easily find a specification, and the, a fair amount of thought seemed to have gone in and was actually written down as to what the design behind this was. Uh, my impression is, I, people here can probably tell me more, that the assumption for Win32 threads was that it was intended to work the same way, but I had trouble finding something that, was actually, that actually made that very explicit. Um, it, pthreads itself is, is a fairly widely used threads API. Uh, as I said, it's in some sense surprisingly close to correct, uh, given how simple the specification actually is. Um, I'll mention in several places here that if we compare this to something like the Java or C-sharp approach, that's really a different issue for a couple of different reasons. I mentioned that there the threads are really part of the, the language specification, which is where they, belong, where they belong, I'll argue. So that part is good. But there are also other significant differences here in that these, those languages were designed for different constraints, which actually turn out to affect the, the, uh, the possible thread semantics that you can use. So I'll spend a little bit of time here describing exactly what the pthread rules are. And I think these are basically also the, the Win32 rules. Uh, so the basic rule behind pthreads is that we don't allow concurrent modification of shared variables. So threads uh, can operate on shared data, but the pro it's the programmer's responsibility to make sure to acquire sufficient locks or whatever to make sure that no two threads ever access the same data at the same time unless they're both reads. Uh, and the appropriate quotation here from the, the pthread standard, and I think this hasn't changed in years, so. This one came from a relatively recent spec, but I think it said that for, for probably close to a decade. Uh, so basically, uh, things are restricted such that no thread of control can read or modify a memory location while another thread of control may be modifying it, which says precisely that there may not be any data erases. Uh, you should also pay attention to the fact that it says there uh, they may not read or modify a memory location, which is an undefined term, and we'll, we'll go into the implications of that in, later on. Um, such access is restricted using functions that are used for synchronization, so basically locking functions uh, like uh, pthread mutex lock in the, for the pthreads API is, is the most conspicuous one there. Um, this is then uh, this has the nice property that it's seemingly independent of the language specification. So it says this is solely in the API specification. This isn't part of the language specification. The C and the C++ specifications don't say anything about threads. So they're oblivious to threads. Yeah? Did the spec define what is a data erase? Uh, it, 
actually the the spec there is that it didn't uh, I'm taking that to mean a, I'm defining that to be a data race but the spec that the the green part here is not in the spec I see I mean that's not really a definition that's just some English text uh, right okay. uh, but I mean at this definition at this point, I, I'll take a data race to be uh, two concurrent accesses to a memory location, not both reads, okay. which is OK. And that's, uh, so I'll talk about data races for the rest of the slide, for the rest of this talk, but I won't be more precise about it than that. And in fact, I mean, there, there are some problems with that definition, which I will, which I'll mention. Um, this approach actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, the main reason for not talking about data races is that it basically uh, almost successfully avoids the issue of talking about the semantics of concurrent accesses to the same memory location, what's normally referred to as a memory model. Uh, so we don't really need to, need to say what happens in the case of a data race, and that dodges all sorts of interesting, uh, all sorts of tricky questions. Uh, the canonical example, perhaps, here that everybody uses is the following. Um, assume, and that will generally be the case for the examples in this slide, that all variables are initially 0. Uh, thread 1 sets x to 1 and then reads y. Thread 2 sets y to 1 and then reads x. Um, is it possible in that case that both, uh, the, both of the values read from x and y in both threads are 0? If we view threads sort of with the most naive interpretation of what threads do, it's interleaved execution of those statements in the two threads. So one of the assignments has to come first. So obviously, the global, uh, obviously one of the globals should be set to one, and that outcome should be impossible. So under this simple interleaving interpretation, what's normally referred to as sequential <laughs> consistency, and again, I'm being sloppy about definitions here, sorry. Um, some thread has to execute first, and we, we can't get both the red values to be, zero, to be zero. So one of them has to be one. In practice, if you look at how this code is actually compiled and how this is implemented, uh, the answer is most certainly yes. Uh, for, actually, for several different reasons, because uh, it's possible for a compiler to notice that, well, x and y are separate variables. Uh, therefore, this, uh, therefore, there's no dependency between the two statements in each thread. Remember, the compiler knows only about single-threaded semantics. Therefore, there's absolutely nothing wrong with an optimizer reordering those two statements. And if I reorder the two statements in both threads, clearly I can get both of the, uh, the red values to be zero. Um, the other reason is that if you look at existing hardware, they typically use store buffers. So what actually happens is the values of x and y, they go into store buffers. Uh, and they, don't, they become visible to the local thread immediately, but not to other threads necessarily. And as a result of the store buffer, you can get the same effect. And that happens on uh, nearly all architectures, actually. Um, so pthread successfully dodges this whole issue uh, and basically declares all of this illegal because this code has a data race, right? It can, it, uh, it can store into x while another thread is reading it. So uh, th there's clearly a data race here. And as a result, the, this has, um, exhibits undefined behavior. And we're done. We don't have to say anything. So the general idea behind such implementations is that the compiler doesn't know anything about, uh, about multiple threads. And it almost is good enough that it doesn't know anything about multi multiple threads. Since uh, basically with this approach, synchronization free code, any code that doesn't involve calls to, uh, to locking operations or the like, uh, ends up being optimized as though it was single threaded. And that ends up being mostly OK, with the argument being that if a thread could observe the difference, could observe the fact that we're rearranging code in one of these sections that has no synchronization in it, then it would have to be concurrently accessing uh, some, uh, some data that the first thread is modifying. So therefore, there would have to be a data race. And the meaning of the program would be undefined. So the compiler could get away with whatever it wants to, which is what, what it's doing. 
So, uh, so generally that works. Uh, there's an issue about how to deal with uh, hardware memory reordering, but that's relatively simple in this kind of model as well. The, basically any synchronization functions, locking primitives and so on, contain needed memory barriers or needed, needed fences to prevent the hardware from reordering memory accesses around the synchronization operations. And again, so long as they only reorder between synchronization operations, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's fine because we can only observe that if the program has a data race. And in that case, anything whatsoever may happen anyway. Uh, the sync in order to prevent the compiler itself from reordering memory references around uh, synchronization operations, it's good enough to simply not tell the compiler anything about these, uh, about these synchronization operations. So the compiler basically treats these synchronization operations as possibly updating any memory location whatsoever. And as a result, it can certainly update, it can, could potentially, in the compiler's view, update any memory location that any other thread can see. So as a result, moving code around this call would be illegal even in a single-threaded case, just because the compiler doesn't understand what this function does. Um, so as a result, this, as I said, this almost works, and compilers that follow these single-threaded optimization rules, in fact, very rarely break code. So why doesn't this, in fact, work completely? Well, one of the issues is that I'm being sloppy about definitions, and I'll, I'll illustrate all of these as we go on here. Um, if we actually want to define what a data race is, and when two threads concurrently modify the same piece of data, we need to have some semantics for the underlying programming language in mind, because otherwise we can't tell you when two concurrent modifications are going on. But in order to do that, uh, we need to have some memory model, we need to have some thread semantics in order to just define what a data race is. I'm not sure whether this is what you were getting at, but this is, uh, that's certainly one issue. Um, the other one that's actually been fairly widely recognized in a pthreads context, uh, at least, is that it makes reference to this undefined term memory location. And it turns out that that's intentionally undefined. Uh, on the other hand, we can't really get away without defining it. And I'll say more about, more about that. I mean, we need to have some definition of what a memory location is before we can specify what a race is. And this actually does have practical implications that are very significant. Uh, the other question here is, if you look back at what the, uh, what the pthread specification says, it's also not clear what it means to, to synchronize memory. Um, there's a fairly straightforward implementation here, which actually compilers uh, compilers used uh, at least a while ago, uh, which is relatively easy to implement, but it actually doesn't have the right semantics. Uh, basically breaks code that, you, that looks perfectly reasonable and that everybody expects to work. Uh, the last issue that I'll go over briefly here is that we actually need to worry a little bit, especially in the context of C++, about a relatively small amount of code that actually does like to access variables using data races. Uh, programming completely without data races doesn't seem to be adequate in a few cases. Uh, so there has to be some fallback, some way of dealing with, it, with that as well. So let me say a little bit about the definition here. What, do, what does it mean for there to be concurrent, for some, some memory location to be modified while another thread is accessing it? Uh, well, as I said, the basic problem is we need, to, we need basically to define the programming language semantics in order to define the programming language semantics. So we, it's circular here. That's not a completely silly point. Uh, consider the following example here. Again, assume initially all program variables are zero. Uh, if, we have a if we have the code written as in the middle of the slide here, um, basically what happens here? Well, uh, if x equals one, x is not one, so this code is not going to get executed. Y is not one, so this code is not ex going to get executed. So there's really no, it appears that there's no issue here that there's a data race. Because in fact, nothing is getting updated in this code. 
if you interpret this naively. On the other hand, what if we had some clever optimizing compiler, and this is, this is, well, actually not very clever optimizing compiler, but some randomly transforming compiler is more like it, uh, <laughs> which decided that, that since the compiler is allowed to apply any transformations that are sequentially correct, that are correct on sequential code, well, one way we can implement this is we can speculatively increment y, and then if we guessed wrong, we just decrement it again, and we're back where we started from. So that's OK. Over here, we do the same, th we do the symmetric thing. But now, if we look at this transform code, this clearly does have a data race, right? Because uh, the increment of y here can certainly happen concurrently with the test on y there. So we can have concurrent accesses to the same variable. So we now have two pieces of code which are sequentially equivalent, one of which here looks like it has, a data it has a data race, the other one doesn't. And by the current spec, the compiler is allowed to freely transform between them. So something here doesn't make sense. Uh, so what's missing here, basically we have to define when the reads and writes actually can occur. So in order to do that, we actually do need some sort of a semantics for the concurrent language. We can't just punt on the language issues. The compiler transformations do affect, unavoidably affect the, the concurrent semantics of the language once we add in a threads library. Uh, so we need to say something here. We need to give somewhat of a memory model if for no other reason other than just to define when data races occur here. Uh, Java takes one particular approach here, which is actually something that was, I guess, originally advocated by uh, Sarita Adve and others for the, the hard, coming more from a hardware background, is that we basically make the guarantee that uh, any program that uh, is data race free under a sequentially consistent interpretation. So if we interpret the program as an interleaving of the actions of the threads, if the program is data race free under that interpretation, then the program should behave, uh, behave in a sequentially consistent manner. It should behave as though it's executed by just interleaving the actions of the threads. Uh, and in fact, our, our approach will be to, to also make sure that this is true for C++. So that will be a goal here. OK, next issue. What's a memory location? And this is probably among the issues here. I think this is the one that's probably bitten the most people in practice from the anecdotes I hear. Uh, so consider the situation where we have a, a structure declared with uh, two fields f and g. Uh, with two different types, with two types T1 and T2 for now. So when is it legal to say concurrently write uh, x dot f and x dot g? Well, it's, it's legal if the fields f and g don't reside in the same memory location. That's the POSIX answer. And uh, the question is, what does memory location actually mean here? Well, I mean, there are some cases in which it clearly is not legal, it turns out, and unlike in Java. If we look at C or C++, it, it may be, though not quite with the syntax here, uh, but it turns out that if, if f and g are adjacent one-bit bit fields, so they in fact end up in the same byte, on conventional architectures, the only way to actually update uh, to update one of them is to read the whole byte, update the bit, and write it back which means that if we concurrently update the other field, we may lose the update. Uh, so with bit fields, there, uh, there probably is no way to really allow these to happen concurrently without incurring substantial performance overhead. You can do this with a compare and swap based implementation, but you don't really want to usually. Um, it turns out there are other cases in which this might not work. Uh, and we'll go into some of those in a little more detail later. But uh, if f and g are, in fact, adjacent byte-long fields, and you're on an architecture that doesn't have byte stores, and the canonical example here is the first generation of alphas, uh, 
then you get into the same problem even though these are not bit fields. And the, uh, the standard answer there seems to be that uh, as far as we know, there are no such modern architectures. So in fact, you should probably ignore that problem. But historically, I think this motivated the, the POSIX situation. Um, the current query vector machine is still following that category. Yeah. Oh, OK. You can judge whether that passes the modern architecture test. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> That's a good data point, actually. I didn't okay. realize it. Machines do. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the problem with the current situation is we don't actually know when it's legal to concurrently write those two fields. And the problem is if we look at existing code, my impression is a large majority of multi-threaded code in fact does something like this. It's fairly common to have structure fields protected by different locks. Uh, I think if you look at some OS kernel code, in fact, uh, people go through extremes the sort of worst case example here seems to be the process of thread structure in the kernel, which normally has some incredibly complicated locking discipline for every field in the, in, in the structure. Um, so there are some other issues here. It turns out even if you can implement this in a way so that uh, adjacent rights don't interfere with each other, the compilers sometimes actually optimize, uh, try to optimize field accesses by reading and rewriting adjacent fields at the same time. So if you're overriding more than one field, they might tr try to do it with a single memory access, and that encounters similar problems here. Uh, it, you can get similar issues with byte array writes if uh, compilers try to combine those somehow. Uh, it's even conceivable that you can get into this problem with, clo with global variables that happen to end up close to each other in memory. Um, I, I'm not sure that any compilers actually did this, but the current standard seems to allow it. Uh, so as a result of all of these issues, POSIX actually ended up not specifying what a memory location means. And uh, I mean, as I sort of hinted, if you take the POSIX interpretation to its extreme, you get to completely absurd uh, places. So you yeah, again, assuming uh, variables are initially zero, if we have two threads, we have two character variables. Uh, thread one assigns one to x, thread two assigns y to one. You would kind of like to know that when you're done here, they're both one. But by the current standard, you can't tell that. Um, in fact, you can't tell that they're not both 42 when you're done. So that's not really a very good situation. Um, so as I hinted at earlier, this does in fact appear, this does in fact appear to have a reasonable fix since there's well, at least little hardware around that uh, actually causes serious problems here. Okay, last issue here is uh, what does it actually, what does the statement synchronize memory around uh, the synchronization functions actually mean? This is actually an example that originally came from SGI and motivated a lot of this, uh, motivated some of us to think about these things. Um, if we have code, the code on the left here, and this sort of stuff seems to get done in, um, in libraries fairly frequently if the library is intended to support both single-threaded and multi-threaded environments. So you have something that occurs in a loop possibly uh, due, to due to function inlining. Uh, so you have a test here, am I multi-threaded? If I'm multi-threaded, then acquire a lock. Do something that updates a global G, that uses and updates a global G. And at the end, if I multi-thread it, unlock. Now the problem is if an aggressive compiler looks at this, and especially if it has some, some access to profile feedback information, uh, and this has been run a few times, especially on standard benchmarks, all of which are not multi-threaded, uh, it will notice that, well, MT is usually false, so we should optimize for that case. So what happens is it really doesn't want to repeatedly access the global G in the loop here. It really wants to promote that to a register and then access the register instead inside the loop. So if you do that, well, in, in single-threaded code, sure, if you don't understand what the meaning of lock and unlock is here, there's a perfectly reasonable way to do that. You uh, read the, the value of the global into a register, then if I am in fact multi-threaded, now this is the expected case, the unexpected case that I'm not optimizing for, well I need to recover. 
So I'll take the register contents, store them back into the global, acquire the lock, and then read the glo global contents back into the register. And then inside the loop here, I'll use the register instead of the global and do the converse thing here when I exit instead of the unlock. Now, yeah? What is the reason for rewriting the register into the global? We could just have said lock and then uh, reread the global, right? Uh, in, well, the problem is here after some number of, I mean, I can probably optimize, the, let me see. Both the first budget. one, I need to do. I mean, I need to do some careful analysis, right? Because I need to know that I, I'm not after the after another loop iteration here. So, um, I think there are actually ways to optimize this that give the correct answer. But the problem is that it was fairly, it's fairly common not to. I think, or at least at the time, it was fairly common not to. So the problem with this is if you look at the sequential, uh, sequential code that you're trying to optimize for the not MT case, this makes perfect sense. This is a perfectly reasonable way to optimize this. If you look at this as multi-threaded code, understanding what lock and unlock do, uh, this makes you cringe. This is completely wrong, right? Because you took code here that in the multi-threaded case accessed G only while the lock was held. And I now introduced a bunch of accesses to G here, which are outside the lock, with the lock not held. Uh, so th this one, this one, this one, and that one here are now global accesses uh, where the lock isn't held. So as a result of that, I've just introduced a race into this code. And in fact, this code can break. On the other hand, it, if I read the specification here, I'm required, I'm required to synchronize memory with, uh, at these calls to lock and unlock. And certainly at the calls to lock and unlock, memory has the expected state. So it's not clear that I'm violating the letter of the rule, the letter of the law in any sense. Uh, so that's the point that's being made here, is that in fact, at lock and unlock calls, the uh, uh, the memory contents reflect the logical state. And again, the problem is that the compiler is basically adding stores and data races that aren't really present in the source. Uh, so this is, um, this is really something that's, uh, I, I think, completely unacceptable. In particular, if you try to specify when this behavior can possibly happen, if you try to give a programmer guidelines for avoiding this sort of specification, I haven't been able to come up with any. It basically, the guideline basically is hope the compiler doesn't do anything bad. And that's, <laughs> um, that's not a good situation. So we really need some way of precluding this sort of transformation. Uh, what's a little annoying about this one is that if we look at this particular optimization, it in fact occurs in other contexts where it's clearly beneficial, where it's unlikely to cause problems, but it can conceivably cause problems. So here's a really simple loop. Uh, which just traverses a linked list, C-style traversal of a linked list, with, uh, and it counts up the number of positive elements in the list. Now it turns out it's clearly beneficial to promote the count variable here to a register if it's originally global and increment the register, read the global count at the, the beginning and store it back at the end. The problem with that is if in fact this it, there are no positive elements in this list that introduces a stored account which wasn't there in the source. So you, can't, you may in fact be introducing a data race in this, pro, in this process. So that, trans, that transformation is in fact also not safe. It's a little annoying because it's a fairly common optimization. I guess the, the, the sort of standard definition of common here is that if GCC-02 does it, it's pretty common. So. Um, and it potentially breaks things. It's something that we have to disallow because I think it, it has potentially very, very strange effects. On the other hand, it's annoying that we can't, uh, we can't do it anymore. <coughs> uh, there are actually ways to recover this optimization. We need to make sure that we store into count only if the original loop actually would have. Yeah? Is, is the summary here that um, write to synthesis is the problem, or are there other things besides write, write synthesis? Uh, 
the problem here is, is mostly write synthesis in some form or, and uh, introducing writes that are wider in some sense. The previous problem was right. really all, wide. All it has to do with writing, writing it all, to memory. It essentially has to do with writing to memory that extends beyond uh, the expected, uh, where the program is expected to be written. They all have to do with that, more or less. Or put another way, if the compiler invents an invisible write, there's no way the programmer can correctly lock it. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, okay, so, so far we've been dealing with correctness issues here and uh, pthreads basically requires uh, programs to be what's normally referred to as fully synchronized, no data races. Uh, and this is certainly a good idea for most code, I think most people would agree. Uh, the problem is that there are occasionally small sections of code that really can benefit greatly from allowing data races in the code. Uh, and we probably have to support those in some way, and sometimes those account for a significant fraction of, of application performance. Uh, to see this, I, don't, I think most people here are probably fam roughly familiar with the numbers here. Uh, these are actually uh, glibc numbers here, uh, but I, I suspect on most platforms they, things really look fairly similarly, similar. If you look at what's required for lock acquisition, uh, for lock acquisition and release, you typically need a uh, dynamic library call, at least on the, this was done on Linux, you need a dynamic library call for each one. There's probably, there might be some way to optimize that out depending on how much flexibility you want with the thread library. Uh, and you typically need uh, two atomic operations combined, usually combined with some sort of memory barrier for the lock acquisition and release, one each. Exactly what you need here is actually an interesting story that could be the subject of another talk. But that's, uh, but basically you need something like this. And the costs of this vary significantly across platforms, but they can be quite substantial. Uh, so if we look at just the compare, exchange, compare and swap, compare exchange cost uh, on different platforms on a 2 gigahertz Xeon, in a, this is a case where everything hits in the cache, sort of best case. A uh, toy timing loop. Uh, on a 2 gigahertz Xeon, I, get a, I measured about 124 cycles. On a 1 gigahertz Itanium, I got about 10 cycles. On a, on a 500 megahertz Pentium 3, I get 25 cycles. And then uh, the memory barrier or memory fence costs are sort of generally on the, on roughly on the same order. Uh, if you look at the x86 architectures, they're, they're included in the compare exchange here, so you don't really, this isn't really a separate cost. And then this is sort of a quick timing of how much the lock unlock pair costs altogether in processor cycles. Uh, so we're talking significant costs here. Remember, this is all cash hits, so we're not talking about any cash miss penalties as part of these. Um, so how can we do better than this? Well, there's in fact a large literature on lock-free algorithms, which is both good and bad. It tells you that it's hard to do because you, people are still publishing papers about it, and it is. Uh, however, there are also some cases here which are in fact fairly common. So all evidence suggests that it's very common to, uh, to use this idiom called double, ref, normally referred to as double-check locking, and I'll say a little bit more about that. I'll also give another example here where sort of we can demonstrate that actually synchronization with locks isn't very practical. And uh, somehow cheating and relying on the behavior of data races can uh, buy you a sufficient performance that it sort of makes the difference between practicality and not practicality. Um, the uh, PLDI paper that I had in 2005 has another toy example using the Civil Veritasenes, which is actually very similar to the parallel garbage collection example here in the, as to how it, how it behaves. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about double check locking because it's, it's an interesting and extremely common example of where people actually use data races and half the time don't realize that they're using data races. Um, so the scenario here is that we want to lazily initialize some variable x. And we want to do it in such, the obvious way to do this is whenever we access the variable x, we first acquire a lock, then check has it been initialized. If it hasn't been initialized, we initialize it and then release the lock. That works. It has the major disadvantage that we have to acquire and release the lock on the fast path through the code, which is on every access.
typically we assume the initialization is less critical because it happens only once, but the, the object may be accessed many times, so we want to optimize that case. Uh, so people have, a long time ago, came up with this clever trick for avoiding the, the locking on the fast path. So you first check, is it not initialized? If it's not initialized, then I lock. And in order to sort of avoid the obvious race here, I check again, is it initialized now? Because it might have been initialized in the meantime. And then uh, if it's still not initialized, I initialize it, and I set uh, init the initialized flag to true, and I unlock. Uh, the problem with this is if you look at something like the pthread specification, uh, this is, as it stands, incorrect because there's a data race on X initialized here. Because one thread might be setting X, X initialized here while it's, it's holding the lock, while another thread is testing it out here. So this has unde undefined semantics. It actually turns out it has undefined semantics in practice often as well. Uh, for, for reasons that we can discuss later. I think I have a slide that I removed from the presentation to save time here. But, um, uh, but the point is that we really want something like this to work in practice, though probably not in exactly that form. OK, my other example here is what happens to, uh, this is actually the tracing phase of a parallel mark sweep collector when you use explicit locking in order to protect the mark bits. Uh, there are, uh, I'll just say, I mean, I don't want to get uh, derailed here into a different topic, but uh, the basic issue here is that I want to concur I want to update mark bits in multiple threads that are cooperating. Uh, it's very unlikely that I will happen to update the same mark bit from different threads at the same time. On the other hand, I need to protect against that. The way this algorithm works, if I actually happen to up, if I happen to store into the same mark bit at the same time, so long, by two threads, so long as so long as one of them succeeds and sets the bit, the rest of it basically doesn't matter. It where things work. Uh, so the, what I'm measuring here is actually th several different kinds of locks. These are again p-thread locks, p-thread mutexes, p-thread spin locks versus uh, just relying on the fact that if I store into a byte of an array, if I use each, if I represent each mark bit as a byte, and I just store into the byte of an array, I know that that's in fact atomic on this architecture. Uh, I, can get, I can avoid using the lock. And this is the, uh, the trace performance sort of measured in, in, uh, in execution time. Uh, for a 200 megabyte heap with these three implementations. The interesting thing to notice here is that if I look at the sort of single-threaded unlocked performance using atomic updates, it's better than the, the fourth two processor times two threads, four thread performance uh, using locks. So in fact, by using locks, I almost get back to the point at which I would have been if I just run the whole thing sequentially. So that doesn't really buy me much of anything. On the other hand, if I rely on atomic updates here, yeah, I can actually do quite a bit better. Uh, so that's basically just what this slide says. Uh, if I used to do this with pthread mutex lock on uh, four pseudo processes, this is actually two hyperthreaded processes. Uh, I end up with something that's slower than the unit processor version, so there's really no, bo no point in bothering with all the concurrency in that case. So where does this leave us? Uh, well, what I tried to demonstrate here is that pthread-like specifications after the fact, leaving the language specification alone, really aren't adequate. We need to give, uh, we need to give semantics for the concurrent programming language. Uh, so we need to specify really when there can be a data race, when data can be re other data can be rewritten as part of an assignment. Uh, as part of an assignment, can additional reads and writes be introduced in other contexts? And the answer here will be no, as, as expected. Uh, do I provide any guarantees for code with data races? And these are clearly all sort of compiler language issues. 
In addition to this, and this turns out to complicate things significantly, we need, really do need atomic operation support for occasional unlocked shared access to global, uh, to globals for those few cases in which it's necessary. So we need a proper semantics for, for multi-threaded code. Um, so the basic, so this basically gets us to what we're doing now. Uh, as I said earlier, well, we need a memory model. We need thread semantics. Java has a fairly reasonable one at this point. Uh, there's a group of us at this point working together, trying to revise the C++ standard in order to also give it some, a corresponding memory model in some sense, to give it uh, multi-threaded semantics. Uh, currently, we have strong support from the C++ committee, I believe. I think that's also Herb's assessment. Um, and uh, as I'll point out here, there are in fact some interesting technical challenges that come up in the process of doing this. Uh, so this was, has all been done for Java. So the question is, why do we still have a problem here? Uh, well, if we look at a language like, like Java that's type safe and is designed to support sandboxing, is designed to support untrusted code in the same address space, and the C sharp here satisfies the same constraints, um, then we have some relatively strong requirements on the multi-threaded semantics. In particular, it's generally not acceptable to leave semantics for anything, much of anything undefined uh, because you have no control by definition. You have no control over all of the code. If you're running untrusted code in your address space, you can, you can probably count on an at a potential attacker actually exercising the undefined portions of the semantics. And if things can go wrong in the undefined cases, then you're still in trouble. So you haven't really won anything. Um, in addition to that, there's also probably as this is so slightly different issue here uh, that you need some additional guarantees about immutability of objects, at least in the Java case. I'm not sure I understand the C-sharp security model well enough, but there, there are other issues that arise in this case. In, in Java, you would like to make sure that strings and similar data are to some real extent immutable. So that if you test, say, a file name, this is Bill Pugh's example from a long time ago, if you test a file name uh, as to if, well, if somebody is trying to perform some potentially dangerous operation and has to pass a security test first in order to be able to perform that, that operation, typically you might say perform a test on some string that represents a file name uh, and if that string corresponds to, a, direct, to a, a suitable directory someplace in slash temp or something that you don't care too much about, you might let the application go ahead and perform the operation. Uh, on the other hand, if the, that string itself can change between the time you did the security test and the time the operation actually gets performed, then you're in trouble. And the problem is if the memory model doesn't guarantee that strings actually can never change, you can get yourself into that situation. I can create a string in one thread, then hand it off to the other thread before the contents of the string are quite visible. The security test will, might look OK because it sees the uninitialized version of the string. The actual operation, some fraction of the time, will end up getting performed on the fully visible string and will do the wrong thing. So I have uh, constraints like that that I need to worry about, which I don't really need to worry about in the C++ case. Uh, there's some evidence from the Java spec that those requirements actually add some complexity to the spec, so we, want to, we certainly want to consider doing without them in a language like C++ where we don't have type safety to start with. And uh, a lot of these issues don't apply. You're not going to run untrusted code in the same address space as a traditional C++ application. Hopefully not, anyway. Uh, so in C++, we're in a different situation. Undefined semantics are OK. Um, there's some argument that fully defining the semantics is probably more expensive. And this is one of the many places where actually real measurements would be good. But so far, we have only intuition here. Um, so for example, if I declare some pointer y, and then in some thread, construct an object S and store a pointer to that object in Y. In, an, in another thread, 
uh, I check whether y is still null or whether the thread one has been initialized, has initialized it. And if it's been initialized, I call some virtual function in, in y. The question is, is this allowed to fail in sort of unspecified ways? The Java answer would be no. I need to provide guarantees here. I can't see, I can't let the C a partially, cons uh, a partially assigned pointer Y. That's one possible failure mode. If pointer assignments went atomic, this could fail because I could see something that's neither zero nor the address of X. Or it could fail because I see the proper Y pointer, but the, the V table inside the object hasn't been filled in yet, or the pointer hasn't become visible yet because it's still sitting in somebody's write buffer or whatever. Um, and in Java, none of these things are allowed to fail. In C++ so far, our take on this is that uh, we are going to allow these things to fail. There is a data race here, clearly. I'm writing Y as I'm, as I'm reading Y over here. And we will take data races like this to, to result in undefined behavior. Um, the problem is that th with, I mean, in some sense, it would be nicer to disallow that behavior. There's no question. Uh, but disallowing the behavior requires some other things that we're hesitant to require. It requires atomic pointer assignments, certainly. Uh, and the, no, the set of platforms on which we expect C++ to work probably extends down to smaller processes than what we, want for, what we expect for something like Java. Yeah? Um, as you point out, there's a, a data race here. Yeah. Which means, which means not only that you might have visibility issues of the updates preceding the store to Y, but that anything might happen. I mean, the, right. y, the y pointer may contain 42 and not be a valid pointer at all. Right. You're referencing into, so a certain, it's, it seems to me you certainly need the atomicity anyway, um, because, because otherwise you can't even guarantee that you're not gonna go, try to go to a page that doesn't exist. Uh, on, on Java, you do. I mean, if you, if you say that any data, res data race results in undefined behavior, as we're proposing for C++, then you don't. Because jumping off to a bad page is consistent with undefined behavior. The small embedded process right. thing here is also kind of a red herring because um, pointers, uh, pointers, I mean, that kind of a pointer is pointer size, but there are other pointers <coughs> that are bigger than pointer size, pointer to members and whatnot which even modern processors can't do atomically. And it's not like a single that, move. Yeah, that's a good point, so, yeah. So I, I, and I, don't, I, I do think you need to allow this behavior, because otherwise everything like this, I mean, perfect would be astounding. Yeah. So, so I, I heard Hans say, for example, that the, the performance hit, uh, we don't have numbers, but it's, it, the gut feel is that it might be significant. I just heard you say it's astounding. Does anybody actually have data on this, or are we guessing? Guessing, you have the instrument to compile it? Yes. <laughs> it would be good to get numbers on all of these things. There are a whole bunch of things here that we would like to have, have numbers on. We don't. Uh, this is a technology point in time. That number will vary. In fact, I mean, looking forward, it's probably going to get worse. Yes. It's not likely to get yes. better. So I'm not sure how a measurement today would necessarily solve any Yeah, that, that's right. clearly also a concern. I and mean, the other thing I, I'm worried about, and I also don't have good numbers on, is that, I mean, you need to ensure, vis in order for examples like this to work, you need to ensure visibility of the VTable pointer. So you want to make sure that when the, this pointer gets stored into, the V table in assignment that happens as part of constructing X here is in fact visible. Uh, in many cases, the, it, this is highly architecture dependent, but in many cases that requires some sort of memory fence to, in order to ensure that. We believe that on x86 it doesn't. I think we believe that on PowerPC it does. Uh, and, uh, and on Itanium it requires a weak fence. So, uh, um, the. In Java, I, this sort of overhead is probably tolerable because constructing objects is generally combined with allocating them, and you don't do a lot of you don't do that much of it. Uh, in C++, my impression is this sort of incident constructor incidence is very very high, and I, it's it's a question of how many of those you could optimize out. If you actually need memory fences in a lot of those cases, this becomes very problematic. Uh, so the approach we're taking is we're taking something that's sort of in spirit similar to the, the p-threads memory model, uh, 
which I think is basically the same as also in spirit similar to what Win32 did. Um, so data races uh, continue to have completely undefined semantics. If we have no data races, we want to give you sequential consistency, and we want to be careful about defining what all of those things mean, and we want to be fairly, in doing so, we want to be restrictive about what memory locations are, and what we're proposing to do actually is to ensure that the only time several objects share a memory location is if they're in fact both bit fields and they're adjacent to each other. So are we done? No. Uh, well, the problem is, as I said earlier, we really need atomic operations to support concurrent accesses for, uh, for things like sophisticated lock-free data structures that you might want to put in a library. Uh, those, those seem to be useful because they give you significant performance advantage and for things like double check locking and for things like the garbage collecting example. Uh, the problem is this really complicates the definition of a data race and uh, potentially ends up re-raising some of the issues that uh, arose in the Java discussion that we were actually trying to avoid because they resulted in a fairly complicated specification. Uh, and maybe things here are even worse because it turns out in Java the, the atomic operations that are allowed are actually relatively restricted in that you only get atomic operations with certain ordering constraints. Uh, and we probably, that's actually started to get people into trouble in the Java context as well. And I think it's probably not the route we want to go here. So, um, so let me actually at this point go a little bit more into the atomic operations again to sort of illustrate more what the kind of mechanism we really want to provide there. And I'll use double check locking again as the example here. It's also probably the most pervasive one. Um, so if you think back about our example, we're checking this X initialized flag to check whether we need to reinitialize, whether we need, still need to initialize X or not. Um, the, the model that we're pursuing here with this sort of atomic update is we, we're, we're asking the programmer to tell us that these updates are special. So this flag X initialized has to be declared as a special atomic variable to, in order to allow concurrent accesses. And concurrent accesses to these atomic objects count as synchronization operations, so they don't count in determining when there's a data race. Uh, by flagging them in this way, we, we accomplish a couple of things. Well, we make it clear to the, both the compiler and the programmer that there's a data race involved here. So there's, a, there's some tricky code involved here. I think a documentation aspect here is actually quite useful. Um, we ensure atomicity on the updates to the X, something like the X initialized flag. Uh, and in case of a Boolean, it's hard to imagine that it wouldn't be atomic. On the other hand, in general, I do need to ensure that the, the updates to these things are atomic. And we provide a mechanism of specifying ordering constraints here to specify how these atomic updates here may be reordered with respect to other memory operations, which is often necessary in order to get good performance. So here's, well, here's sort of how I want you to write double check, how I want people to write double check locking, but not really. Uh, so the, the important change here from the previous example, from the way it was written in the past, is we want the X initialized flag to be declared specially. And currently, the, the draft proposal is to have it declared something like this. Uh, in fact, it turns out that's the only required change from the, from the code I had before. However, I, uh, I wrote the rest, rewrote the rest of this in uh, verbose syntax in order to make it clearer what you can, what you can do and what's actually involved here. Uh, so what I then want to do is when I, when I load X initialized here in order to test it, uh, I, want, I want to do it in a way that declares, that tells the compiler that this is a race. This is, but it may happen concurrently with the change to X initialized. So I need to do, read this atomically. Uh, I need to do an atomic load on it. And I want to do it with what's normally referred to as acquire semantics. I want to ensure that this load actually happens before any later operations in the code here. 
Uh, and if, uh, if that succeeds, well, if in fact this was already initialized, then I can go ahead and access x at this point. And because I insisted on this ordering constraint here, I'm in fact sure that the, flag, the test on the flag, flag x initialized will happen before I actually access x and potentially get on, and thus I really can't get uninitialized data. Uh, if not, I'll acquire the lock here, and then I'll reread x initialized. In this case, I actually don't particularly need any ordering constraints on the load because I'm actually reading it with a lock held, and any updates will also hold the lock. So I, raw here basically means no ordering constraints. It turns out in most contexts that's extremely dangerous, but in this case that's safe. Um, if I just left this code alone, actually I would get a load with acquire semantics, which is safe, and on x86 would generate the same code, but it's, uh, I, I'm being really explicit here. And when I actually store into this flag, I need to store into it with a constraint that says this store to x initialized actually needs to become visible after the assignment to x. So that's what the release here tells me is that store it, store it after sort of operations that have preceded in the code have been made visible. Uh, so more precisely, store with release here ensures that preceding stores are visible to a subsequent load acquire the reading variable, uh, reading the same variable in another thread. Uh, and this is, yeah? To be even more precise, that means to a reading uh, load acquire that reads the value that the store wrote. So uh, right. Uh, actually, there, there are several possibilities here. I think that's most likely the way it will turn out. There's several, there, there's several nearly equivalent possibilities there, but yeah. Uh, if you look at the code a couple of slides back that used the uh, X initialized. Um, how does the compiler, how can it differentiate between the two use of, of, more, uh, of X initialized in the belief statements? Like you, here you have a load acquire and a load raw. In the original code, it was just checking X. Which is checking X initialized and in fact, the, <laughs> The way this will, uh, the way we're proposing to do this is, uh, if you just read x initialize, there'll be a, there'll be a conversion here that uh, defaults to doing a load acquire, so you can still write that code. But I, I'm not sure that answers your question. I, okay. So the the current intent is. Okay, so is the, just continuing that the compiler is aware of block means I can now do raw loads and that. X-initialize? No, uh, no. Uh, the compiler would, in this case, uh, treat if you didn't actually put the syntactic gunk in there, if you wrote the nice code, uh, both of those would end up being load with acquire. It turns out, so you w could conceivably get slightly slower code on some architectures. It turns out on, uh, yeah, actually you might get slower code in the, in the slow path on PowerPC. That's probably the, the help. expansion as opposed to what the compiler would expand the atomic to. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, it, there's a, there are other operators here that are they're less explicit operators, like assignment turns into a store, it turns into a store release and also. So, but so th this is the, the most explicit syntax that gives you the most explicit control to it just acquire release normally and this you're showing how you have knobs that you can override that if you want to you can over exactly in your example actually there's one other thing you're relying on you're relying on that entering a lock is implicitly an acquire operation and that, uh, that unlock is an ex implicitly a release operation otherwise it's right. right and the uh, the intent is certainly to, to specify them that way uh, there's, there's a subtle question here about whether uh, uh, whether these things are only acquire and release operations, but that's, uh, I think, the proposal. So the Java memory model has a uniform way of dealing with all of this. It has this notion of a synchronization variable, and basically say, writes to synchronization variables are, are sources of what happens before edges and reads are synced. This right. is the same thing you're and, talking and about. This, is, this will, in that sense, this will basically be the same the, the problem is the Java memory model doesn't have the equivalent of raw there, which sort of complicates. 
matters. And uh, they're actually struggling with this to some extent because it turns out you want the, the raw case, for example, for incrementing atomic counters. Uh, because if you're counting how many times some, uh, some function is executed, you really want, to, want that to be very cheap. You want it to be a very cheap operation, uh, and the fences are, on some architectures, the expensive parts of that. So you would like to be able to avoid the fence, but that makes, yeah, that makes it very tricky to program with, and it's only, I mean, it only works in a few isolated cases, but it seems to be important in those few isolated cases. So the point is that you want to allow races on some variables right. uh, without actually saying that they are synchronization operations. Well, we, we are saying that the synchronization operations always in terms of the declaration of the, the variables that have races allowed on them. So these will always be declared as atomics. I see. So for the performance counter, it would not be declared as, for example, atomic and uh, consequently reads and writes. Oh, no. No, so it would be declared as atomic, but there's a compare and exchange of a compare and swap operation on atomics. Uh, that specifies the ordering constraint as raw. So you can specify that it's unordered, or you can specify it as a, having acquired semantics or release semantics or both. Oh, I see. And you would actually use the raw in, in the normal course for performance counters? That's uh, for that's performance you counters, you would use the raw. I suspect that's far from the normal case. But in most cases, you want something else. But but it is it is it does seem to be something that you do need okay i think um we're sort of running close to out of time here but uh let me explain quickly why this actually it, uh, affects the atomic why atomic operation semantics are important here and they actually affect us in trying to define the existence of a data race for example <coughs> Uh, so the question here is, uh, does basically, does this program have a data race? And you need to stare at this for a little bit, but this is a little hard to read. Sorry about that. But basically what I'm doing is I'm storing to a global in each thread. It's the example from before. Essentially, I'm storing to a global in, in one thread in a way that's completely unordered in this case, and then reading uh, from the other global in the same thread. So if I interpret this sort of under completely sequential, under sequential consistency, everything happens in order within each thread, I would be guaranteed that, again, R1 and R2 both zero is impossible because one of the stores to X or Y has to come first. So you can read it. Ugly syntax aside, the first line there basically says X gets one and Y gets one, and the second line says R1 gets, gets Y and R2 gets X. Um, OK, now the question is, uh, since these are atomic operations, they're allowed to race. They don't count as a data race. So we don't have a data race for that reason. But now the question is, do we have a data race on Z below? Well, we have a data race on Z only if R1 and R2 can both be 0. And under the sequentially consistent interpretation, uh, they cannot. On the other hand, we explicitly said that these atomic operations don't have ordering constraints and therefore can be reordered. So this really should allow the possibility of a data race at this point, because R1 and R2, both 0, are intend this, that's intended to be a possibility. Um, so in, st in spite of the fact that under sequ a sequentially consistent interpretation, this has no data race, in this case, we actually do want to say there is a data race. So we, in the case of these funny uncon semi-unconstrained atomics, we actually need, to need a more complicated model of what it means for there to be a data race. Um, so the question then came down to how do we specify this? Uh, and I'm not sure. I don't think I have enough time to go into this in detail, so I'll, I'll quickly outline it here. So the idea is sort of fairly conventional in a sense. This was actually sort of uh, came out of a discussion with Bill Pugh to some extent. Uh, so any resemblance to the Java memory model here is not accidental. But uh, so the idea is again we define a happens before relation which basically ensure is sort of the equivalent of sequential ordering within a thread which tells us something about the order in which things have to become visible uh, 
uh, as usual, this isn't a total order. It happens before he is defined in kind of a funny way. Uh, it's basically intra-thread. It's the sequencing uh, for, for non-atomic operations. It's, we essentially want sequential consistency in determining whether there's a race. So for non-atomic operations, we just use the intra-thread sequencing ordering. For atomic operations, we use something more complicated. Uh, and in addition to that, we combine that with an ordering, which is basically the synchronization ordering, which basically orders any, uh, which orders any uh, release of a lock before the acquisition of the same lock or a store into an atomic with the, uh, with the read of the atomic that reads the value. And it turns out, and I would really like to encourage people to look at this in more detail since we really need somebody to scrutinize this and it looks like you would be the right person, one of the right people probably to do this. Um, then based on this definition, we essentially can use a fairly conventional definition <laughs> about what uh, what possible values be, are visible to what, uh, to what reads. Uh, so this basically gives us a, a way to define the semantics of, uh, of threads in C++. This is then really used primarily to define whether or not there's a, well, it's used for two, re, for two purposes. It's used to define whether or not there exists a data race. Um, as, as we said down there, if there exists a data race under the semantics, then we get completely undefined behavior and we don't guarantee anything. If there does not exist a data race, then we allow any interpretation that's consistent with these visibility rules here. Yeah? What if the programmer is declared B is volatile, so you can't prefetch the 47 or 42 and 17 or something? Uh, we, there actually is a there was a long discussion of, of whether volatile has anything to do with this, and I think the bottom line is probably no. The, uh, the C++ committee still has, uh, uh, still has to, to revisit this issue, uh, but I think there's some fairly convincing arguments, actually, you don't want to change the existing volatile semantics, so probably, and currently the consensus seems to be that volatile has no useful semantics in connection with threads. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I will skip this. Um, so a memory location in, in this approach, as I said before, is, a, uh, is basically any non-bit field object uh, or a contiguous sequence of non-zero length bit fields declared in the same structure. Uh, so in defining a data race using the preceding mechanism, we count writes to different fields differently, except that writes or accesses to, this, uh, to bit fields in the same contiguous sequence of bit fields are treated as though they were writing the same object, essentially, as they were, they were touching the same objects. Uh, it's actually then, yeah? Should the memory location definition include some notion of alignment, natural alignment? Um, my feeling is probably not because there is, that tends to be highly platform dependent and uh, I think you, you would rather not to have people count on that. Uh, so far that, that, hasn't been, that hasn't been the proposal. Yeah? Uh, so you wouldn't let the compiler optimize single byte bools down to bit fields for example? That would kind of screw up things. Uh, in this case uh, you would not be able to do that. Uh, do you, if you can do individual individual bit updates, or you can, uh, I mean, or if you have a very uh, cheap compare exchange operation and you can update it that way, you can do it. Or if you can prove that the fields are only accessed by a single thread, which you probably have to prove something like that anyway in order to make sure that you can change the the layout with. Okay, so uh, very quickly. Uh, it does require compiler changes, basically no speculative or unnecessary stores. Uh, you can't unnecessarily overwrite uh, structure or class members. The tricky example here is the one that's provided there. Uh, if you update the field B, uh, 
uh, in the middle there of that structure, which is customarily packed into a single 32-bit word, you in fact have to implement the B update as two byte stores. You can't read the whole word and then write the whole word back, which is what most compilers do these days. Uh, a speculative register promotion of the kind we talked about earlier so with, with that example is, uh, is typically illegal now, or you have to be very careful about how you do things. Um, there are some other issues here. Some kinds of code hoisting actually end up introducing, write, again, speculative rights where there weren't any in the source. Um, <coughs> There's a issue, tricky issue here about moving stores above potentially non-terminating loops. That's, uh, that's not allowed under the proposal. There are some implications on architecture. Byte stores are basically required in the architecture. Or at least you have a tough problem of, of avoiding of getting around there, there if, if they're missing. Um, Atomic operations are likely to be, become highly desirable, so, though this will probably, I'm not sure, this may, be, may end up being a somewhat optional part of the standard that's unclear. Uh, there's a subtle issue here about enforcing the transitivity of happens before here, which is mostly a, uh, uh, an issue with the current x86 specification. Um, so the current status here quickly is there's a web page which describes sort of the current proposal. Uh, we still have primarily an informal proposal at this point. We're working on st Clark, Nelson, and I are, are starting to look at uh, st writing standard D's for, for this. Uh, it, this definitely needs further scrutiny. Uh, there also is a very preliminary, uh, but more detailed than what I presented here, interface to the atomic operations library. Details of that are still a bit controversial. Uh, and I'd like to encourage people to look at this and send us feedback. Thank you. <laughs>